today is a day of remembering. And aside from the extra long weekend, the barbecuing, the summer kickoff celebration, we take time not only in worship, but also in our own conscience and our own soul to remember those who touched our lives, who are now, as the scripture tells us, are now our great cloud of witness. They are waiting for us in God's kingdom. And although they've departed us, their legacy is still alive in our hearts and our minds as well. And it is a time not only to remember those who have touched our life, but to reflect on the rest of our life as well. And so to understand what life is all about here in this time and place, we return this morning to a letter. A letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in Rome. And we must understand that those in the church in Rome during that time were really not that much different from us today. I mean, they might have dressed differently and talked differently, and they might not have had smartphones, or, but, but there was a mixture of a generations coming together. There was diversity. There were different social classes. They were learning how to not only get along with one another under this new thing called following Jesus, but they were learning how to form a, a true community. What's that about? Filled with diversity. They were trying to figure out this new thing called Christianity and how, and how it meant, what it meant, and how that changed their daily life, how they should live. And not to steal a line from our last sermon series, but they were desperately trying to figure out how to live in the real world and still strive for the ideal or the perfect. And in their confusion of not only what they believed in, what was this Jesus thing, who was this Jesus God, not only were they struggling in that, they were also struggling in how to act, how to live their daily life. And Paul writes to the church and tries to bring some leadership and some direction and some clarity to the daily lives of those in this community and followers of Jesus. And before we look at the scripture we're going to look at this morning, we kind of need to, to look at the whole letter that Paul wrote to the churches in Rome. And in the first four chapters, first one through, or chapters one through four, Paul writes about a need for righteousness or a need that we have to live right, to live just. Um, justification. What is just? What is right? Because Jesus kind of turned that upside down with his teaching and preaching and ministry. And, and Paul covers that what we as broken humans can, cannot do for ourselves. There's some things that God does for us that we can't do for ourselves. Things like grace, things like forgiveness, things that make it impossible for us to reconcile with our God and our Creator. And he focuses on what God does for us, not what we do for God. And that we must trust in Jesus Christ that God will keep His promises. Paul kind of sort of lays it out, what all God does for us in Jesus Christ, so we can understand the magnitude of God's love for each and every one of us. That's kind of the first part. The second part, chapters 5 through 8, Paul talks to those already committed to following Jesus. Um, he talks about something called sanctification. And that's a big word, I know, but it's, it's kind of a process by which we broken, kind of messed up people, that, that we've been justified in their faith. And we're being transformed in the saints so that their life reflects the righteousness of God. It's how we must live and approach life as those who walk with Jesus Christ. And that's a lot of theological lumbo jumbo, but I'm going to make it simple for you. The first part, one through four, we, we must believe we are forgiven. For all the bad things we've done in our life. Verse 5 from 8. That we must live as, the, as those who have been forgiven. And, uh, and God understands we can't do this alone. We can't live up to our greatest potential in life on our own. And if you think about that, that's so true. I mean, even in our, 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 our walk in life, we need help. We need parents to nurture us. We need teachers. We need 
need coaches. We need other people to help us live up to the to push us, to encourage us, to criticize, to keep us accountable when we want to fail or slack off. And God knows we don't have the necessary tools to live in this world with a life totally representing the awesomeness of God and His love for us. So God sends. He sends His advocate. He sends the counselor, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, intuition, gut feeling, instinct, whatever you want to name it. God sends the third part of the Trinity to walk with us through our suffering, to be there in our pain, to walk with us in disease, being there when there is brokenness of our world. And that's what we look at this morning as we turn to the 8th chapter of Romans, beginning with the 14th verses. We look at what is the spirit thing and how does it work. Paul writes, for those who are led by the Spirit of God, are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought you out, brought about your adoption into the family of God. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His suffering in order that we may also share in His glory. In our life, suffering and pain is unavoidable. But as followers of God, we must look forward to the day when we inherit our inheritance. And I don't know about you, but, but for me, the hardest thing to accept that I am a child of God, the creator of this universe, the creator of all being, the one who sent his son, I am God's child. And I, being a, a, a child of God, has an inheritance waiting for me. That is huge for me to understand. And I don't know if it's hard for you or not, because I look at my life and there's a lot of messed up things in there. And how can I be the child of God and an heir of Christ if, if I've got all these messed up things? And in our life, there's, there's so much pain and suffering, and it's unavoidable. But as followers of God, we must look forward to the day that we inherit our inheritance. We are sons and daughters of God. One day we will inherit the kingdom of God. But until then, the Holy Spirit gives us strength to keep going when we have none. When life feels overwhelming, we have the Holy Spirit to help us through. When we live by the Spirit, we begin to see our world from God's point of view. You see, when our world hurts, God hurts. When we share in God's suffering, we can also share in His glory. And what does that mean? For me, it's, it, it, it's kind of like, you know when your children or your loved one get hurt? Not physically, or maybe physically, but, but, but emotionally, someone breaks their heart, someone breaks up with them, or, you know, and, and they're hurting. It's kind of like you hurt too. And sometimes in life, when, 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 when the ones you love's heart is broken, even though you had no part of it, you can't help but have your heart broken a little bit also. God views us the exact same way. What happens in this world that hurts the heart of God should also hurt the heart of those who love God. And that, that's a sermon right there. If I have to step back and look at it, what happens in, the, in this world that hurts the heart of God should also hurt the heart of those who love God. That's big. Paul continues in verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom of glory of the children of God. Basically, 
meaning that God one day will return it to the Garden of Eden like it was intended when He created it. We know that the whole creation, verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to the family of God, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they've already had? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit itself intercedes for us through the world wordless groans. And those who search their hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Many people when they get to be about my age, I never thought I'd be one of those measures at my age. I always thought I was young, but now I'm realizing I'm not as young as I used to be. Or my mind thinks I am. But many, many of my, my, my friends that are my age kind of experience what a lot of people call mid, midlife crisis. I mean, it's time when, 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 when we get to a certain maturity, if you will. We get to a, 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 a change. We kind of change from, from pursuing life and we begin to refocusing our life, if you will. We realize that, 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 that life is fragile as we begin to attend the funeral services of, of those we grew up with and, and, and we know and, and love. We realize we are closer to death than, than we are our birth in the span of life here. And that's what Paul is talking about here. It's a time when you realize your childhood dreams and goals might not be fulfilled. I was the youth minister at a church I grew up in, and, and one of the, the uh, fundraisers for our youth to go to work camp, actually, was called February Follies, and it was our, our main fundraiser of what every, of, of, to fund the trip for all the young people, for people to go. And one of the elders at the church, at the church approached me uh, and asked me out to lunch. And when you're the youth minister at a congregation and one of the elders asked me out to lunch, it's not necessarily a good thing. So I met him for lunch, uh, and, and he comes with a briefcase and a portfolio, and he opens it up, and that always scares you uh, if you're a youth minister. But he begins to tell me of how he has this idea of make, of getting some of the, the, the people uh, his age, he was in his mid-50s, getting some people together to form a band. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Um, okay. And he wanted me to play drums for them. Okay, if the elder of your church that you work for asked you to play drums for your fundraiser, you say yes, right? Okay, so so I said yes. I was like, sure, you know, yeah, well, whatever. Well, then he proceeds to hand me a practice schedule, the songs we're going to play, what key they're going to be in. Okay, I'm playing drums. There is no key for y'all not musicians out there. Uh, and, and, and I say, okay, I'm like, you know, telling Kelly, you know, pray, just keep me through this. You know, one time we'll play a couple songs, people in church, we'll have a good time, you know, whatever. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, that that it went okay. Uh, they weren't bad musicians, you know. They were they, they were they were probably good in the, you know their their twenties, but somehow that dream of being a rock and roll star just kind of kind of went went to the side. But it didn't stop there. Not only did we have to play, then then we had to play for something else. And then the wives, their wives went in, and they lost studio time to make a CD. <laughs> And then before you know it, I'm like, get over my head. Uh, you can't tell the people no. Uh, and so, you know, I'm just like praying, leaving my drums at the church with the doors unlocked. Pray someone like to steal my drums or whatever. Um, but, but, but they were trying to relive, and they're not nice people, but they were trying to relive this, this their youth. And they realized their dream of being a rock star really wasn't going to be. And me being a part of the disciples band really wasn't going to be either. But many people can't handle this. I mean, they suppress their feelings of how fragile 
wife is, and they, they come out, and, and, and they come out as unusual or in unpredictable behavior. And, and maybe, maybe at some point you realize that maybe you want you won't accomplish the dreams of your childhood. And maybe as simple as it comes out with a, with a new hairstyle, a new color, or a, or a tattoo, or, or they begin to dress differently, or they trade in the mama van for a sports car. Maybe it's as simple as that. But then some people begin to exhibit destructive behaviors like a divorce or an affair, or they begin drinking. And then, and then maybe, maybe it's none of those. Maybe when they get to that point in life and they realize that their childhood dreams might not be fulfilled. Maybe they just walk through life with a proverbial sunburn and just kind of mad at the world for no reason. I mean, they walk around like scared, like someone is going to touch their sunburn. And the underlying problem is, is that they were followers of Jesus, but their, maybe their life didn't reflect it. They didn't set their hopes and dreams on what God promised out of life, only what they had promised themselves. I mean, is it wrong to dream and set goals for your, for your life? No, of course not. No, it's not wrong. God wants us to dream and set goals. Is God's promise always counterintuitive to our own goals and dreams? No. A lot of times our goals and dreams and God's run parallel to one another. Most times we are one and the same. We just don't realize it. Does it mean we're going to have a hard life? No, it doesn't. But we might be always feeling like something's missing. We don't follow what God has. We might run through this life always wanting more of something or bigger. We might regret wasting so much time and effort and energy and resources on things that, you know, at the end of the day, things that don't really matter much in this life. So how, how do we do this? Paul says this. Life by the Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, whatever you want to call it. He says, follow that powerful voice inside of you. <coughs> that, 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 that thing, and you know, if you don't have a word for it, you know what it is. It's that, that thing that, that, that's inside of you and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're thinking about someone on, on your mind. And they're there. And then you wake up the next, and then you go back to sleep, and then all through the day you're thinking, I need to call that person. I need to send them an email. I need to see. And us be known to you, there's something <coughs> tragic going on in their life. That's the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. It's, 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 that, it's that voice inside of you that makes you just pause and take a deep breath and say, you know what? And maybe you say it outside, maybe you say it inside to yourself. You, you, you take that pause and you say, you know what? This really ain't worth getting that upset about. Really not worth getting that upset about. Huh. Mark and Saul played the Memphis Grizzlies last night because they lost in the playoffs. At halftime, they were leaving. The, the, the announcer came up to him and said, you were frustrated. What were you so frustrated about? And he smiled and said, it's something I need to work on. And walk on. Maybe that's the spirit. Maybe, maybe it's that feeling or urge you have that says, you know what? Getting dirty and getting in the mud and playing with the kids while they're young is better than having a clean kitchen. I don't know. It's the, the spirit will, will allow you to find that balance in life. Does it mean never to clean the kitchen? No, it doesn't mean never to clean the kitchen. And you ask God what you should do in any situation. And you sit back and you pause and you listen. And that is what Paul says when he says that the Holy Spirit will intercede for us. It's don't sweat the small stuff. Make every minute count. Cherish relationships over stuff. And even in the suffering and the pain, know that you do not suffer alone. When we begin to learn to live more by the Spirit of God... Our groaning will lessen. We will see our blessings clearer. We can avoid disastrous midlife crisis. And we can turn our groaning into God's glory shining through to those around us. So that when that day comes, when we receive our great reward as children of God, when we inherit the kingdom of God, others will speak of us one day as 
those who walked and were led by the Spirit of God. I can think of no better way to be remembered. 